doing our best to keep to time today. So just to say, uh, this session will be recorded and shared with you after the webinar. There's a Q&A function at the end of your screen and also a chat function. So please feel free today to put in any questions or chat uh, in the chat function there. Um, Brefni, just while we're waiting to, for more people to come in, you, you had a question you were going to pop um, or put out to the group, I think, um, yeah. there. Yeah, far ahead. Um, firstly, just to, again, to reiterate, a big welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us on your lunchtime. Uh, we're delighted to be presenting here as part of Palliative Care Week. And there's three areas we're going to be looking at. Um, uh, firstly, around palliative care and delivery of palliative care. Um, uh, secondly, a think ahead and planning ahead for end of life care. And thirdly, uh, on grief and having conversations around grief with patients or even among ourselves. Um, so maybe just to think if there is anything within those three areas that you would particularly like to get from today, uh, I would just invite you to pop it into the chat function and we'll keep an eye on that and uh, we'll feed it back to the presenters as they go through their various um, presentations. So I suppose just an opportunity for you to think, look, is there one thing that would be helpful for you from this webinar today uh, in one of those three areas that is on palliative care and the delivery of palliative care, on uh, thinking ahead and end of life care planning, uh, or on grief and bereavement and having conversations around any of those topics. Thanks for that, Prefni. That's great. Um, just to introduce myself, everybody, I'm Maurice Damery. I'm program manager in the healthcare department in the Hospice Foundation, leading out on the development of the Irish Hospices uh, Foundation's new Dying Well at Home program. I'm um, delighted to be involved in organising this webinar and uh, to invite all the GP nurses in today. We had practice nurses and community nurses yesterday and Family Carers Ireland the day before, which is fantastic. All sessions, uh, everybody got very involved and there was lots of chat. Um, as many of you will know, this is Palliative Care Week, which is an initiative of the All-Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care. The theme this year is Palliative Care, Living Well as Possible. So in support of this, um, we're running these three webinars. So just welcome you all here today and thank you for giving up your lunch time. I hope you have a, a sandwich there in the background. We'll be doing our best to keep to time. Um, I'd especially like to thank Marie Cantwell and the HSE for helping us set up the webinar. Um, my colleagues Siobhan Murphy, uh, Susan Ganey, Brefney McGuinness, Nicole Forrester and uh, Valerie Smith who are presenting and supporting the webinar today. So just before we get going, I was just going to ask uh, Marie Cantwell, uh, who many of you probably know is your professional development coordinator for GP practice nurses in the HSE, Dublin, North City and County. Um, just to say a couple of words there, Marie, if you'd like uh, at the start of the webinar. Thanks and welcome to you. Thank you and thanks, Marie. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining the webinar. I know most of you are probably grabbing a very short lunch break in the middle of a bit of a crazy day. So your commitment to coming on and to learning is valued, I promise. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm one of your PGCs um, and I'm based here in Dublin North. And I use every opportunity to say that no matter where you are based in the country, even if you don't have a PGC in post, if you have any issues, concerns, problems, or even fantastic ideas, please don't hesitate to ring any of us. Um, we are always help, happy to help and delighted hear from anyone no matter where you're based. Um, firstly, I suppose I want to thank the Irish Hospice Foundation, particularly Maurice um, and all of today's speakers for um, turning their attention to GP nurses as part of the Palliative Care Week. I, for me, in my experience as a GP nurse, GP nurses do palliative care. We look after patients, families, communities from cradle to grave. And even though your initial thought when you hear the words palliative care might be end of life care or terminal illness, the palliative care approach is broader than that. And it's part of the holistic approach, that specialist generalist approach that's so much part of being a general practice nurse. Um, so not for just for kind of end of life care, palliative care is about identifying disease, diagnosis, assessment, management of physical symptoms, supporting your patients psychologically, socially and um, functionally and allowing them to live as well as possible with any life limiting or life threatening disease. And 
if you think of just your chronic disease management patients alone, I'm sure all of you can immediately think of patients that fall within that category, your COPD patients, your heart failure, failure patients. And with Slonja Care and our move more and more towards community-based healthcare, I think GP invo GPN involvement is only going to get more and more. So whether it's a COPD patient looking for referral to a respiratory um, rehabilitation program, or a simple conversation with the patient over phlebotomy, who's maybe considering end of life care. Um, and we, I would think as a GP nurse, part of your skill is knowing what's out there to support your patients. And by attending something like today and learning about the facilities, the services and supports that are there, then that's how you do your best job. You embrace the knowledge, you embrace the information that you're given and you utilize them for your patient's benefit. Um, to that end, I suppose I'd ask you just to support the little tiny surveys that are built into today's webinar because these are going to ensure that your education needs and your wants are, are noted going forward and that GP nurses are um, included as developments and planning is made around particularly primary care based palliative care programs. So enjoy. I'm going to hand you back to Marise. And thank you all again to the Irish Hospice Foundation and well done on a fantastic week. Thanks, Marie. That's great. Um, and again, welcome to you all. Um, Siobhan Murphy, I was going to call on as well. Siobhan is our Director of Healthcare in the Hospice Foundation. So Siobhan is going to say a few words also. Thank you, Maurice. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to say thanks again to everybody for coming on. I mean, um, we know this is a very busy job that everybody's in and they're taking time out of lunch, so we really do appreciate it. I think that, you know, to follow on from what Maurice said, practice nurses are so well placed, you know, to be delivering palliative care and support within GP practices. And, you know, the patients really all through their lives and sometimes, you know, them better than other healthcare professionals because they're attending there always. And so I suppose you've such an important role to play, supporting people who want to plan ahead and through their grief, through their loss, all the way through that journey. So it's fantastic to see such a great turnout here. And I think you'll get some really, really important and helpful information from Brefney, from Nicole and, and from Valerie today, because every time I hear them speak, it just reminds me like of, of, of I suppose, the key things that we can all bring back to our day to day practice. So look, sit back and enjoy it. and. As, as Marie said, chat away to the chat function. It's as interactive as you can want it to be. And we're delighted to have you all. And thank you so much. Thanks for that, Siobhan. And I should have said as well, we have um, the NNBI have awarded uh, CEUs for today's uh, sessions. So um, if, if you'd like a search, you can just email us afterwards, but we will be following on to this webinar with the recording of the webinar um, and also some resource links as well. So that we'll send those on afterwards today. So I suppose we may as well kick off. And uh, our first session today is Nicole Forrester. And uh, Nicole is going to talk about palliative care, living well as possible, just to give a little bit of an overview at the beginning of the session. Uh, Nicole is the development officer in healthcare within the Irish Hospice Foundation. She works specifically on the Dying Well at Home programme, as well as Nurses for Night Care. Uh, Nicole's background is in social work, uh, community development, palliative care, have supported her to work and learn from individuals and families around areas such as housing insecurity, mental health and well-being and grief and loss. So, Nicole, just while you're setting up, we have a couple of questions there. If people um, would, wouldn't mind answering them, we'd be very grateful. Uh, it just gives us, supports us to know what you'd like in the future as well. And what kind of times of the day suit you for webinars? Brilliant. Thanks, Maurice. Um, as um, as Maurice touched on, um, we're just so excited to be speaking with all of you today. And as we're each presenting, we're very aware of the amount of knowledge, uh, education, training and experience in this virtual room. And so we're just uh, it's a pleasure for us to be able to um, to present to you today. And I'm just gonna be giving a very brief overview of palliative care and how it supports people to live as well as possible. Um, and so just starting out, palliative care is holistic care that's focused on supporting people to live as well as possible through relieving pain and other symptoms associated with serious illness, regardless of age, diagnosis, or stage of illness. Um, and palliative care is 
quite unique because it supports people to have conversations about their care and wishes. And the way it supports that is that throughout someone's experience with palliative care, opportunities for those conversations present themselves and someone has the possibility to talk about what they want in relation to their care and also to talk about how maybe their wants and needs change throughout their experience with palliative care and so the door kind of for those conversation remains open through someone's experience with palliative care. Palliative care can be offered alongside other uh, treatments and in collaboration with those treatments and as Marie touched on um, Palliative care enables people to continue to do things that they enjoy, such as their hobbies, and really, um, really in this way, it touches on that psychosocial element of care so that people are able to continue to live in a way that they're, that they're happy with, uh, while also living with a life-limiting uh, condition. And palliative care can, um, can can take place anywhere and um, it focuses on quality of life and comfort for those living with life-limiting illness and chronic illness and it can be delivered across different settings including people's family homes, hospices and hospitals. And so the way that palliative care is delivered um, takes place through a number of channels and these are just a few and so primarily through referrals um, depending on the setting someone lives in referrals can be made to the community-based specialist palliative care team um, and that will ensure that they then are become a part of someone's care um, palliative care is often delivered through a multidisciplinary approach and the primary key for the primary care team is supported um, by the specialist palliative to the community specialist palliative care team and professionals involved in care could be GP practice nurses such as yourselves, public health nurses, GPs, OTs, speech and language therapists, social work, social workers, and the different disciplines could be brought into people's palliative care experience at different times. And so in the same way that palliative care may come in and out of someone's treatment plan, the different professionals that can be involved in someone's palliative care experience can change over the course of their illness trajectory as well across different settings. And so the most appropriate setting for someone to receive palliative care in may change throughout the course of um, someone's illness. And also the person's wishes for where they receive palliative care may also change over time. And this links back into the opportunity for those conversations to have um, throughout someone's palliative care treatment in terms of what they want their care to look like and where they'd like their care to take place. Through accessible uh, technologies, pathways are created for clinicians to remotely monitor and support patients' symptoms. Uh, and then they're able to arrange in-person visits if an intervention is needed. And we saw this become quite common and, um, and kind of necessary throughout the pandemic. But tools such as being able to have appointments through video link really support patients and those who love them um, to limit the amount of unnecessary trips to clinical settings. And it also allows those patients and caregivers more independence, but also to be able to maintain relationships with clinicians involved in their care throughout the course of their care. And of course, palliative care can be delivered with guidance from advanced care planning. And my colleague Valerie will be going into more detail about how advanced care planning supports palliative care provision for individuals. Um, in every healthcare team, there are three levels of palliative care provision with increasing specialization from level one to level three. Um, so level one can be provided in any location or setting by all healthcare professionals as part of their role in and using a palliative care approach. So patients will have their needs met without referral to specialist palliative care services and supports. In level two, healthcare professionals have had additional trainings and experience in palliative care. And there's an intermediate level of uh, expertise related to palliative care, which can be provided to patients again in any location. And in level three, services and professionals whose core activity is focused on provision of palliative care 
that that's where these uh, these um, professionals rest in level three. Supports are involved uh, in the care of patients with more complex care needs, uh, which may require a greater degree of training and staff resources. And reiterating what we've spoken about before, palliative care can be delivered anytime. And so any stage after someone is diagnosed with a life-limiting um, illness, um, palliative care can begin uh, to be involved in someone's care plan to support ma the management of symptoms, pain, and to improve overall quality of life while living with a life-limiting illness as needed. And so people may have, may transition from having palliative care services and supports within their treatment plans, depending on their needs and also on their care priorities. Um, in this way, palliative care is a very dynamic type of care, and it's really tailored to the needs and the individual that's receiving it. And in, in the same way, palliative care can be delivered um, to those living independently or in community settings, such as nursing homes or hospitals or, or hospitals. In collaboration, so palliative care can be delivered while other elements of care are taking place. For example, someone can be receiving chemotherapy and also receiving palliative care at the same time. And when someone's ready to have palliative care support and services uh, in their home and as part of their journey, that's the time after, after diagnosis that palliative care um, can, can begin to be accessed. And we know from speaking to many people that palliative care can be a really frightening and intimidating um, term for a lot of people. And uh, it can be really scary. And so being able to have conversations about what palliative care is and how palliative care can benefit patients and also benefit people who are caring for patients can be a really great way to create clarity about what palliative care can mean for each individual patient rather than um, thinking about it as a blanket term. And lastly, these are three resources that can give more in-depth information about palliative care, how it's delivered, and um, it can answer a lot of questions as well if people are unclear about what palliative care can do for them. And so firstly, the Irish Hospice Foundation's um, webpage has a, has a section on it de de uh, devoted to palliative care. And in that section, there's an FAQ about palliative care. And my colleague, Susan, is going to be sharing these resources in the chat as well. So you can look at them in your own time. Um, the Palliative Care Week leaflet put out by the All-Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care um, also is a brilliant resource. And one of, the, one of the highlights of the leaflet is that it shares some personal stories about how palliative care has supported people to live as well as possible. Um, and lastly, the Palliative Hub, it's an excellent resource. There's so much information on, on it about palliative care in Ireland and um, it's great for um, uh, professionals as well as patients and family members. So that's it for me. And thank you very much for your time again. And uh, I'll pass you back over to Maurice. Thanks for that, Nicole. That was, that was great. I suppose it's just kind of bringing us back all the time to the fact that, you know, Palliative Care Week is really raising that awareness around the importance of remembering that palliative care is not just as end, end of life, but it's there for people throughout their illness to support them to live as well as possible in a holistic way. And it can improve the quality of life for the person and for everybody around them. So that's really, you know, what the aim of this week is about. Um, so our next speaker today is uh, Valerie Smith. So I'll introduce you, Valerie, while you're setting up there, if you like. Um, so Valerie is going to talk around Think Ahead today and advanced care planning and about having those important conversations. Valerie Smith is public engagement lead with the Irish Hospice Foundation, and she manages the Think Ahead programme. Valerie is an ordained interfaith reverend holding a master's in divinity and is additionally trained as a death midwife and a support group facilitator. She brings these skills into her work uh, to make dying, death and bereavement a normal part of our everyday life. So thanks, Valerie. Thank you so much, Maurice, and I'm delighted to be here with you all today. Get set up. There we go. So welcome everybody again. Um, I'll be presenting today on Think Ahead, which is our advanced care planning tool. And I wonder um, if anybody has experience with advanced care planning already, if it's something that you've used in, uh, the, in your practice or in your work at all, or even with family and friends. 
Um, so if you, you have had some experience or if, even if you're brand new to it, you might pop that in the chat there so we can get an understanding of, of where you are. But no matter what um, exposure you've had to this already, I think it's useful tools to always be engaging with and learning about what's new. Um, so we call this kind of presentation having important conversations. And I have that highlighted there um, because I also like to call it having courageous conversations. A lot of times talking about end of life, death and dying and bereavement are very difficult and they do require sort of a bravery of the heart uh, to get into. So hopefully today we'll be, we'll be, be able to provide you with some tools for having those conversations. Uh, so our aim for Think Ahead uh, and in your practice is that patients are supported and encouraged to do a few different things. The first of that is to understand and discuss what end of life might look like, might be like for, for them. Uh, in the slide, I used to say, uh, discuss what the future might hold, but that's, I think that's not using the right language. And so even just practicing using what end of life, what death and dying might be like is important for us to each bring into our work and our practices as well. We also want patients uh, to understand and ensure that, or, or sorry, to ensure that they and their loved ones are better prepared and less stressed in facing death and dying. Um, I also wanna remind you that you and your loved ones can also be better prepared and less stressed in facing death and dying as well through advanced care planning tools such as Think Ahead. And we want patients to be able to make decisions that are upheld, um, that uphold their own wishes, values, and treatment decisions through all parts of their life so that their decisions, their wishes, their values are uh, valued through end of life and into death and dying. This is a quote from Dame Cicely Saunders. She's the founder of the modern hospice movement. And she said, how people die remains in the memory of those who live on. And I'm sure that all of us in our lives have, can think back on experiences of, of losing someone, of somebody dying in our life that was very difficult. Um, and other experiences that may have been a better death, a better end of life experience, one where we might've said, that's how I'd like to be, um, or an experience that was that taught us how we didn't want our end of life to be. And all of your patients will be coming in with these experiences as well. And all of these uh, past experiences really are, you know, do guide how we approach end of life and events care planning. But it is an important time to start talking about death and dying if we aren't already. Um, one of my favorite quotes, <laughs> I was just thinking, sorry. One of my favorite quotes says, uh, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the next best time is today. And so I do think, you know, now is always the time to start talking about death and dying. But if we haven't before, now is a really good time to start talking about it. Uh, in part because the Advanced Decision-Making Capacity Act comes in uh, we're hoping in November of this year <clears throat> that it should be uh, commenced. And one of the things that this act does um, is that it, it binds healthcare teams to the decisions of patients. So if a, a patient has recorded uh, their treatment decisions prior to, at some later date, not being able to express them or or uh, not being able to communicate their wishes, if they've previously recorded that, written that down, voice recorded, uh, video recorded what they'd like for themselves, their healthcare teams are required to, um, to follow those directions. I'm not sure what the experience within this group is and the knowledge on the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act. Um, so if you do have experience working with that as well, um, or if it's brand new to you, you might pop that in the chat as well so we can see kind of where people are with that too, or if there are questions on that. Um, another thing, so again, the ADMA, one of the things it does is it allows people to record their decisions for a later date. <clears throat> and this encourages a patient-centered approach to care, but it also protects healthcare teams from having to make some of those harder decisions. Um, and of course, over the last few years, talking about death and dying um, has become 
front and center because of COVID. A lot of us have experienced bereavement and deaths and loss in our life and certainly in our work. Um, and a, a side effect of this is that more and more of us are talking to our friends and family about death and dying and giving thought to our own end of life care wishes. So people are beginning to have more open conversations about this. But of course, there is a discrepancy between what families think is a good death and some of the challenges that healthcare teams face in providing a good death. Um, certainly families wanna be informed about what's happening. They wanna develop a sense of trust uh, between themselves and their healthcare teams. We want a responsiveness, uh, particularly around pain management. And that really speaks to, I think, some of the palliative care. How do we live as well as possible? How do we, how do we as healthcare teams respond to the needs um, of our patients to be, to be well throughout their lives or to feel well? We all want to maintain a sense of dignity in dying. And uh, we want to know when, and which can be, of course, one of the hardest kind of questions to answer, but something that is important, I think, especially to be using language, uh, really clear language around death and dying as a patient nears the end of their life. But of course, there's lots of strong emotions that healthcare teams face as well, uh, anger, resentment, uh, families not accepting a death coming up. So a lot of stress brings out a lot of really heavy emotions at end of life, which can be difficult to navigate for healthcare staff. Um, lack of clarity around a prognosis as well. If we don't understand what the prognosis is or if it isn't clear, um, that's hard to communicate, of course, then. And then there's always this idea of time, trying to figure out how much time somebody has. And it kind of refers to that last slide as well. But people wanna know, is there time for somebody to come home um, and to be with the family at this, you know, at this late stage? And of course, talking about death is hard for a lot of different reasons, including that it's incredibly personal. So again, like I was mentioning earlier with this um, ideas and the grief that we've experienced previously in our lives, all of that comes up when we're facing death again. A lot of people will think it's unlucky. Um, we come across this a lot. So certainly something that was said in my own family was that talking about death brings death closer. Um, and, you know, we know that isn't true because if we could just talk about things and make them closer, then like I'd be on a yacht in the Mediterranean right now. But um, so we have to address that that superstition as well, or a little bit around uh, talking about death and dying. Uh, these feelings of being, you know, afraid and upset around talking about death and dying. We're also afraid of, you know, if will I make somebody else upset? if I talk about death and dying. And I think one thing we need to do is, you know, turn that back on ourselves and see, do I feel upset if I'm talking about death and dying? And how do I, what needs to be addressed around my own feelings around that? And of course, it's just uncomfortable if it isn't something that we've had experience with. We don't know how to talk about death and dying. It will be uncomfortable for us to start and to try. Um, but all of this, even you being here today, um, and thinking on your own experiences, thinking on even that question of what was a good experience I've had in the past with death? What was a bad experience that I've had? What, which of those would I want or not want for myself? All of that contributes to this thing we call advanced care planning. And it, advanced care planning takes up a lot of different things, but it starts and it's kind of held by these bigger conversations, such as the ones we're having today, hopefully like ones that you might take home uh, to your own families and friends after this as well, and certainly to your patients if you can. Um, within those conversations, when a person gets sort of a, a clear idea of what they want for themselves, we can write that down, we can record that, and that's that advanced care plan. And then at the center of that is this something called an advanced health care directive. So I'll go through all of these, um, all of these levels as well. But essentially, planning ahead is a positive action that we can take. There's a lot of studies that show how it reduces stress, how it uh, reduces unnecessary treatments. We see a lot of um, medical interventions at end of life that don't necessarily improve quality of life, but they might prolong uh, quantity of life. And, um, and that, that can also bring about pain and suffering for people unnecessarily. 
So advanced care planning can reduce unnecessary treatments while improving quality of life at end of life. So in essence, the patient can receive the, the care that they want, but not the treatment that they don't want or don't need. And like I mentioned, there's a lot of evidence. There are more studies undergoing, being undergone um, around advanced care planning, but some of the evidence that has been shown already is that it improves decision-making between healthcare teams, families, um, and a patient. It enhances hope at end of life, which is, I think, uh, an odd thing to, to think about end of life having hope, but it has hope because people know that they can be cared for and they can have the type of uh, life that they want through their whole entire lives. It improves a sense of control, uh, returning that sense of sovereignty and autonomy back to the self. It gives people a voice at the end of life because advanced care plans are often referred to um, after a person is unable to communicate for themselves. It maintains that voice of what they want throughout their whole lives. It lowers readmission rates uh, to hospital and to ICU. And again, just an improved quality of life. So broad spectrum of things that advanced care planning can support. Um, and as we move toward like, how do we have these conversations? Uh, this idea of companioning, I think is great. And it it's comes from companioning or being with people through bereavement. And certainly, as you know, and you've seen in, in your work, there's quite a bit of bereavement that happens leading up to end of life and death, because there are a lot of little losses that we can experience either watching others go through end of life or losses that we ourselves face um, as we near end of life and move toward dying. And so these are just some of the skills I'm sure that you've developed already around how to be with people uh, rather than trying to fix. When Once we reach end of life, there's, there's no fixing that, there's no curing that, um, but companioning is about things that are can, can be with people and help people through the process. Sensitive communication, person-centered care, co-decision-making about treatment, and that's involving even the family as well. All of these can help an individual to face end of life. And we suggest a few tips here is, the first is to start early. So particularly when a patient is still very well. Um, I'll let you know that I have my advanced care plan um, underway because we have a new version of it out now. So I'm, I'm working through mine and um, I have, you know, no knowledge of any illness or, or reason that I um, that I would be dying soon. So starting early kind of helps to remove some of that fear and stress that it can bring up as well. This is just about preparing. You can use open questions as people come in. So have you ever thought about an advanced care plan? Have you ever thought about what your end of life might want to be like? I'll give you a few more of those in, in a couple slides as well. Um, but really open just to even judge, you know, where is a person with this? Is this somebody who has given thought to it, somebody who's completely closed off to it uh, and then making a judgment call from there on how to move forward. Um, be gentle, but, but do be direct. Um, I wonder if you have time to talk about advanced care planning. I wonder if you have time to talk about end of life. Um, you wanna always allow people a chance to maybe get the seed planted, uh, but they don't have to, you know, go dive right in all, straight away. Um, um, so gently allowing that door to open, but using direct in terms of using some of the clear language about what you are talking about and referring to. And then you're always invited to signpost, think ahead. Um, we do have the booklet, which we'll be going through, sorry, the planning pack. And we also have an online hub with a lot of resources there as well. Um, and so, you know, you are often the first people that, that patients will see, or maybe the, the only person that patients will see when they're coming into the office. And so there's lots of opportunities there um, to be starting these conversations with patients. Could be when they're asking about their future, if they have a change in their health status, if they're asking questions about palliative care, um, any type of change or, or new conversation that happening is a good, great time to start talking about Think Ahead or advanced care planning in general. Um, and these can be routine appointments, 
uh, if they're coming in for a different type of like medical checkup for their 70 years driver's license, for example, um, or if there's a follow-up appointment, sometimes people do like to make follow-up appointments to have these conversations as well. Um, and yeah, so there's a number of places where you can begin have these conversations and even feeling like, like I said, um, planting that seed, it doesn't have to be the whole conversation at one time, but just, oh, well, I have you in front of me. You know, have we given, have you given thought to this before? This is a new tool that we have here in the office that I'd like to share with you. And in thinking about that conversation, of course, you know, timing, I know that um, you're all under a lot of pressure. So is there the time to talk about this? Um, is there the time to even introduce somebody to this idea? Are all the people who need to be here, here in the room with us now? Is the environment right? Is it um, too noisy? Are there too many things going on at once and it isn't the right place? Of course, understanding what an individual's expectations are as well. Um, so their expectations versus what you might be hoping to get out of it. And then always remembering, you know, we can take a step back and come back to it and try again in just a little bit of time. Um, and there's any number of reasons why a person would need to do an advanced care plan because we don't all have the same life trajectory. So advanced care plans come into play for in any number of cases. And I'm sure you've um, seen a lot of these in the work that you've done. But to have a conversation before a crisis um, as much as possible so that we have plans in place when and if something does happen. And as a reminder, you know, advanced care plans are used and referred to when an individual is unable to um, make or express their decisions or make those choices. Uh, and that can be because they're reaching end of life or very ill. It can also be because uh, they've had an injury or an accident that is preventing them from being able to make or express decisions. So we all do need these um, in our lives. And it's part of this advanced care planning timeline. So we talk, you know, education, uh, death education and literacy, that's around advanced care planning. And then there are these other elements um, involving palliative care and bereavement that come down the line, but the earlier that we can uh, have conversations around death and dying and knowing what our options are, um, then, then the that adds to sort of this positive or or beneficial um, end of life experience. And so, just a few tips that I'm sure you already have already: working to the patient's agenda, making sure you have all the information, the right environment, having the right people in the room, avoiding assumptions. And we say here of culture, religion, gender, disability, and so on, but also avoiding assumptions about what a person wants for themselves at end of life, because we will all have different expectations and different goals and different values that we want um, at end of life. A few other conversation starters that I like are, you know, if everything goes perfectly well, what would you like your end of life and death to be like? Uh, this is one of my favorites because it's kind of like asking if, if you won the lottery, what would you like? It's just so big and you can think about your, your sort of perfect experience. Um, and then you can kind of start with that's the goal. And now how do we work towards that? And which of those goals can we actually meet? Um, allowing people to ask anything before the set, the session starts, you know, once, uh, an appointment's underway, lots of information might be happening, being shared back and forth and it can get lost. And so opening up to the patient, if there's anything they'd like to ask, whether it's about palliative care um, advanced care planning or any number of other things they might um, they might have on their minds, of course. And then really getting to the heart of it, Eric, what are the, you know, the most important things for you when it comes to thinking about treatment and care at the end of your life? That gets back to that heart of what are your values and, and what are you hoping for? And we find that people really appreciate having these conversations um, get brought up because they might know how to, um, but also because it isn't something that people always feel most comfortable starting a conversation with their family. But if they have, they are able to have that conversation with somebody that they trust, but they might be able to ask more specific questions about, and it doesn't have that emotional resonance as much. Um, they find that to be very beneficial. People feel like their healthcare team cares about them when they're bringing up advanced care planning and making sure that they're getting their wishes sort of thought about well ahead of time. 
Um, and of course, you know, we do find that some people are just not ready to talk about end of life yet. And, and always remembering as much as my goals are that everybody talks about end of life, that some people um, are not ready for that. And they, we have to work with them, you know, work with everybody where they are. So think ahead um, is, of course, it is about your treatment decisions, but it's also really thinking about how we live well through our whole lives, um, how we live well into end of life and death and dying. And it can include funeral planning. It can include um, having, you know, your celebration of life before you're, before you're gone as well, which is what I envision this, this picture to be uh, happening in that picture. But what is Think Ahead? It's essentially, you know, speaking for you when you cannot speak for yourself. It's that advanced care plan that we refer to when you can't make or express your own decisions. It has three different parts to it. It's written in really clear, plain English. It's also a public awareness campaign, so such as like we're doing here. And like I said, an online hub as well. Uh, we do have a number of resources. So the website, uh, the planning packs, uh, conversations over a cuppa are, are guides to having conversations around the end of life. And I'll go through each of these. So in every single pack are three documents. The first is my personal wishes and care plan. And this is not a legally binding part of the Think Ahead planning pack. This is more informational. So it has a lot of um, places for people to talk about their own medical history, um, where they prefer to be cared for at end of life is a, not a legally binding decision that they can make, but they can certainly have a preference and put that down in writing as well. It also acts as um, a storage place for their own records. And so it'll ask questions such as, where do you, you know, do you have a will or an enduring power of attorney? Where are those legal documents stored? Uh, where are your banking records? Things like that, that could be very stressful for family members um, to find and have to collect at end of life. And so it just puts things in a really nice, clear, clean, sort of orderly fashion. It also includes questions in there around how, what type of funeral and things like that people would like. So this is kind of a few of the pages there. One of my favorite things that's in there as well is a um, couple pages called Just About Me. And it's how you would like to be just personally, physically, spiritually, um, cared for at the end of your life. And so a lot of times in particular, because healthcare teams and individuals might come from the same culture or religion, um, it has information about how they would like to be cared for, but it also say, you know, I, I personally run really warm, so I don't want uh, 16, you know, duvets on me. I want to be kept kind of cool toward the end of my life. And, and it just provides information for people to, um, to use when caring for a loved one or a patient. The second document uh, in the planning pack is my advanced healthcare directive. This is the legally binding part or what will be legally binding with the commencement of the act, but generally right now is, is respected um, under common law. So if GPs and specialist teams know about this, when people are reaching end of life, they're respecting the decisions that are put there, even though they're not legally bound to it quite yet. Um, but within a healthcare directive, you can do three things, refuse treatments, request treatments, and appoint somebody to speak on your behalf. And so with this, the first thing, refusing treatments, is where people can refuse potentially life-sustaining treatments. And this is really because, again, this is referred to when people are unable to make or express their own decisions. And so then we would turn to, would they like us to prolong their life? Um, and refusing treatments at this stage must state, you know, even if that refusal has an increased risk of my death, or even if my life is at risk, or even if this will hasten my death, something along those lines, then you can uh, refuse that treatment or then that, that refusal is legally binding. So I do not want to receive oxygen, even if refusal will hasten my death. Um, but a person cannot refuse things like basic care, which is shelter, warmth, or the offer of food and water, but they may refuse artificial care. So feeding to oxygen. 
The second thing a person may do is request treatments. And this, these are not demands. You're not allowed to demand treatment, but you could say, a person may say, I want uh, literally everything possible um, to keep me alive. And so those requests have to be taken into consideration. So I request that I receive oxygen if it will prolong my life. And some people might want that in order to give family time to return or something along those lines. But again, they can be denied if it seemed um, unavoid, unavailable, if it's unlikely to work, or if it will cause more pain and suffering uh, than benefits, then for any number of reasons, it can be denied, but it has to be taken into consideration. And the last thing that we can do is appoint a designated healthcare representative. You can actually appoint two, you can appoint an alternate as well. And this is somebody who the patient has had a conversation with previously, probably somebody close to them, a friend or a family member, most likely, um, who agrees to speak and act on their behalf um, if they're not able to do so for themselves. They agree to the refusals and the requests that the patient has, has put into writing and has agreed to say, I'll advocate for you if you're not able to at, at a later date. And then once everybody's agreed, um, once those documents have been written, it is signed, it's witnessed by two others, including one person who's not a family member. And that's to make sure that nobody's being taken advantage of um, in that situation. And once all of that is signed and everybody's signed together and in the same place and at the same time, then that document is legally binding. And it can only be overridden if you write another one which you can do, you are allowed to write another one, but uh, that would be the way to undo it. The last thing in the pack is the medical summary form. And this is a one page document that we are encouraging GP practices, especially um, to be using. And this would be something that would summarize what's in the other documents. And so we're encouraging patients to come and begin this conversation with um, the nurses and the GPs in, the, in their local practice uh, about what their healthcare treatments might be or to make a copy of this once it's been all in, filled out. Um, the other side has all the summary on it. And once that's been filled out, to make a copy and put that in the file so that people know when the time comes that there are these forms um, that a person has put into place. So I am reaching the end of my time. So I, I know that that's a lot of information there. I have my contact information here. Um, with, that's my direct line and my email. And this um, uh, QR code takes you directly to the Think Ahead page for downloads and orders. And you can always reach out to us and we can we can send you some, some packs as well. So you can get an idea of what's included there. And um, I will turn it back over to Maurice. Thank you for your time. And I know that was a lot of information. So thanks for your patience with me. Thanks, Valerie. That was brilliant. Uh, really, really good session. We were putting some chat in. I don't know if you saw any of it coming through, but there was lots of chat going on through, throughout the session. You know, some people hadn't heard of the Advanced Healthcare Directive, haven't heard about Think Ahead as well. So this session is a starting point and, you know, Valerie's raising awareness around the country and we've um, provided information to ICGP and the GP forum as well so we're really just trying to get the word out there and it's more important now I think than ever with the the act coming through um, and important to nominate somebody to act on your behalf I know I have a copy of the pack I just got it recently it's a really lovely pack uh, very easy to read and really supportive of your patients and I think somebody even had there in the chat function um, it's a good resource to put in the waiting room it's a conversation starter and um, it's 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 really a great resource so please feel free uh, to contact us about it and I think um, one of the slides and I hope you don't mind me putting me on the spot Valerie was that next to kin piece it's it's something I always come back to is kind of you know people misunderstand um, the position of the next of kin isn't that uh, something you have Valerie there too? Yes absolutely um, the a lot of people think next of kin is who decides what happens uh, to a person at end of life, um, but next of kin doesn't have any legal standing, and it isn't, uh, you know, defined legally either. So for myself, my, you know, my mother has two daughters, but which of us would be next of kin? We both are next of kin, and so there can be conflict when somebody isn't defined as who is the person to make decisions. And so having a, a designated healthcare representative defines who you want to speak on your behalf, rather than kind of allow for the conflict or or anything like that to arise as well. And 
just speaking to the waiting room, we, we are developing some materials um, in addition to the packs that um, would be easier to keep in a waiting room, leaflets and uh, kind of accordion um, leaflet kind of things and posters. So hopefully that would help generate the conversation as well. That's a great idea. Um, and we'll send out information, uh, you know, after the webinar with the recording of the webinar, we can send out this information as well for everybody here. But also like Valerie is a great resource if you want to tap into her at any stage, her contact details will be there too. So Valerie, thanks a million for that. Um, so I better move on and introduce um, our third speaker, who's Brefney McGuinness. Uh, Brefney is going to talk today around grief and loss and how to support, talk with and support somebody who's grieving. Brefney heads up the Grief in the Workplace programme in the Irish Hospice Foundation. This provides support, education and training on coping with grief in the workplace to a broad range of sectors, including health, education, IT, manufacturing, state, public and private. Brefney has published numerous articles and resources for workplaces on supporting staff who are bereaved and the development of bereavement policies. He recently published Grief in the Workplace, Responding to Suicide, which is a guide for the employer. He's a drama therapist and a member of the Irish Association of Creative Arts Therapists. Brefney's special interests are coping with hidden or difficult losses and the use of creativity in working with people who are grieving. So you're very welcome, Brefney, and looking forward to hearing your session. Thanks very much, Maurice, and uh, thanks to um, uh, Valerie and to Nicole for their excellent presentations. And I'm moving my head out of the way here uh, as one of the questions that, that people were putting in at the start about what would be helpful for you um, is where to point people towards resources. And, and uh, the Irish Hospice Foundation with the HSE set up a bereavement support line during COVID-19. Um, and this is the, uh, the number there behind me, which is one 800 80 70 77 um, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that as I go through uh, my presentation. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, maybe just to start with, I did ask you uh, about what you would like. Another area is, is again, uh, you know, how we open conversations with people, maybe when there's a diagnosis of dementia or that, or, uh, and how we might have those conversations with people. Um, just, I suppose, along that line, can you think for you, for talking about grief and the grief that you might um uh work with with your patients um and that you might experience yourself if i was to ask you what is the most challenging situation grief wise for you in the work that you do so just if you have to think about that and again i just invite you to pop it into the chat box what for you is um the most challenging situation grief wise that you have to deal with or that you find most challenging uh, in your work as GP practice nurses? Uh, what is, what's the rub or what's the one that you find particularly difficult? Um, and we'll just take a moment or two just to, to let you have a think about that. And I invite you to pop it into the chat box. Um, and we keep an eye on that as I, I go through the presentation. So what I'm going to do is have a look at a couple of different areas. Um, and I'm just going to share my slides here. You can bear with me on that. And hopefully you can see that okay. So the couple of areas I'm going to have a look at are understanding loss and the grieving process. Um, personal and professional grief. So two different types of grief that you may come across in the work that you do. Um, and what can help? How can we talk to and support somebody who is grieving? I'm just going to check in there. So we have a couple of uh, inputs coming in here on the um, uh, in, on your chat function. So how do we talk to people around the loneliness of patients who have lost somebody? Um, how do we support people around sudden death? Uh, and again, the other point in there where the death uh, is somebody that's very young, uh, really good points and, and really challenging pieces there. Thank you for those. 
So I'm going to begin by looking at um, look, what do we mean by the grieving process? And is there a framework that we can use maybe for how we might interact with people? And again, around those couple of areas that you've identified, do you know, when people are lonely, when somebody dies, or how do we talk to somebody, particularly when the death has been the death of somebody young? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, Loss oops, is losing stop. Something. I'm going to show you a short video uh, which is about the grieving process and how the grieving process, uh, maybe a way of looking at it that might give us a framework for how we might interact with people around their grief, whether that grief is of somebody who has died or a change in their circumstances or a diagnosis of an illness, um, or even, you know, again, what has come up earlier, the diagnosis of dementia um, and how we might uh, support the person and indeed uh, other members of the family who might come into the GP practice. So what I would suggest is just have a look at this video and see what stands out for you, if anything does, or something that, that catches your eye. And we'll come back and have a, a, a quick link in around that afterwards. I think that is of significance to us. For most of us, our greatest loss will be the death of a loved one. And we will mourn that loss most of all. Dono lost his mother recently. As she was dying, he was able to be with her, hold her hand and say goodbye. He told her that she'd been an amazing mom and had touched many people's lives. Grief is like a roller coaster. It turns your world upside down. It affects all aspects of your life and involves mental, physical, emotional and spiritual suffering resulting from loss. It is not an illness or something to be fixed but rather a natural process of reaction and adjustment to loss and change. This adjustment involves moving back and forth between loss coping, focusing on who we have lost, and restoration coping, adjusting to life without them. It is normal to experience a range of feelings when we are grieving. Some, like sadness and loneliness, might be expected, but others, like anger, rage and guilt, may be more difficult to accept. The aim of our grieving is to help us adjust to changes in our lives. It is not to forget about who or what we have lost, but to learn to live with those losses in our lives. It's natural to have an uneven journey with grief. Grief comes and goes like waves. There are going to be peaks and troughs and they don't always happen in predictable ways. Some months after his mum's death, Donal hears a song his mum loved and is overcome with a wave of grief. He hangs in there and gradually the pain subsides. Remember that during loss coping, we need to be able to focus on loss and whatever feelings we experience around it, including sadness, guilt, anger, etc. But we also need to spend time on restoration coping, adjusting to life without the person who has died. Where people run into difficulties or where grief gets complicated or is stuck is when the process of moving between these two types of coping breaks down people can get stuck on either loss coping or restoration coping. If someone gets stuck on loss coping, all they can do is think about the loss and the person who has died. They can find it difficult to get on with other things they need to do in their life. But equally difficult is where people get stuck on restoration coping and think, this has happened, I have to cut that person out of my life and forget about them, sell the house, clear out all the clothes, get rid of everything. Good bereavement care involves enabling the movement between loss coping and restoration coping. People need to do both to grieve well. So I'm just going to stop there for a moment and uh, again uh, just come back to you and invite you to uh, pop in to the chat box if you wish it might be a word or a phrase or something that stuck you there in that video on uh, the grieving process. What it looks at is there's two types of coping we do. So we do that bit of touching into the loss, and that might be where we might feel lonely, we might feel upset or a bit down, or maybe we're emotional in some way. And then the other part of our coping, which is a normal part of grieving, is where we're doing the adjusting. And I, okay, so this has happened. What do I do now? to adjust to this in my life. And that can be for a diagnosis, that can be for um, a health uh, issue, or it can be indeed for a death. Um, so that process of going backwards and forwards is really important 
Um, and in terms of your role in the GP practice, when people come in to you, you may encounter them. Uh, and again, maybe coming to the GP practice might remind them of uh, the illness or somebody who has died. And they may move from one to the other. They may move or focus on the grief for a bit and then move back to the uh, adjusting to the uh, restoration coping. Um, and so your role really is just facilitating that and enabling that natural process. So what does that look like? Well, what we're going to do is have a look at another short video. And this is of a man called Dermot, whose mum died during COVID-19. And I suppose this is very relevant because people who you're meeting in your practice will have, uh, like all of us, come through the pandemic. And some people have had some pretty difficult experiences um, where uh, maybe their loved one died in less than ideal circumstances. They may be carrying, um, uh, I suppose, a legacy of that, uh, where things were less than ideal. And what we do find with people, particularly around deaths that occurred during COVID uh, and, and where maybe we weren't able to grieve the way that we would like to or, or give the person the send off that we would like to, um, there can be guilt. Uh, maybe more than there would be in other deaths. And you might be picking that up in the GP practice. So sometimes what can be really helpful is just being aware of that and being aware of how to uh, engage with people around that. So we're going to have a look at this short video, which is of Dermot. And again, just have a think about how you might support Dermot. A Dublin man whose mother died from COVID-19 has thanked the staff at her nursing home for what he said was exemplary care. The Irish Hospice Foundation has recommended that anyone receiving end-of-life care should be allowed to have a loved one present before they die. Dermot Sreenan lost his mother Bridget on Easter Saturday after she contracted COVID-19 at a nursing home in County Kildare. He was able to hold his mother's hand to say goodbye after being supplied with a visor and full protective clothing. It's like being in full Breaking Bad costume with a visor, a welder's visor and hairnets and galoshes and everything else. So uh, it was very difficult. So I just held her hand and I just said that she'd been uh, an amazing mother and that she touched many people's lives. Bridget Sreenan was 88 years old and had a chronic underlying condition. She was being cared for at Craddock House Nursing Home in Nace. When she got diagnosed, she said to me on Skype, she said, I think this thing will finish me. And I said, you just got to do the right thing and fight it, I said, and do whatever the nurses ask you to do. And she did fight it, but she didn't, you know, she didn't win. Well, I'm going to be eternally grateful to the care home for just the level of care that they gave to my mum. They are, yeah, they're exceptional people. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, Bridget's daughter Geraldine was unable to leave the US to attend her mother's funeral. Only 11 people were present for the 10-minute graveside service. Friends and family were instead asked to wear purple, Bridget's favourite colour. My mum was uh, quite vivacious and really loved life and was always up for everything. Dermot and his sister plan to celebrate their mother's life with a special mass on her anniversary next April. Sharon Gaffney, RTE News, Dublin. So again, just coming back uh, to think about you and your practice and, the, you know, if Dermot was to come into your practice, um, how would you support him? Uh, and again, this just trust yourself, trust your own reaction. How would you support Dermot if he was a patient of yours, if he came into your practice, having seen that, knowing that his mum had died? Um, how would you support him? What would you say to him? And again, I just invite you to pop into the chat function. Um, and this is, it's not guess the right answer. It's trust yourself in terms of how you would interact with Dermot. But I think it's helpful, you know, having seen what just what some people have gone through, what would we actually do or how do we actually engage with somebody who is bereaved? So just again, what would you what would you say to Dermot? Yeah, so somebody's saying there, how would you how are you feeling, Dermot? Listen to him. I think that's a great suggestion. 
Um, and I don't know if you noticed in that clip there, um, the interviewer, uh, for me, gave an example of really good bereavement care, and it's picking up on what you're saying there. Um, yeah, yeah, acknowledging. Um, the interviewer didn't say anything. She just allowed Dermot to be how he was. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, in that clip, Dermot got upset on two areas, or two times. The first time was when he was reminiscing about his mum, and he was saying she'd been an amazing mother. And just as he was saying that, he got quite upset. Um, and again, some of your suggestions here around this are really good. Um, you know, allowing him to be upset, allowing him uh, to uh, express his grief, really good suggestions. Um, and again, what, what you're saying there, asking him what kind, what was his mum like? Tell us a bit about your mom, allowing him to express. Yeah, lovely. That one, somebody's actually using those words. You know, tell me about your mom, or I'm so sorry to hear about your mom. So that really good, the acknowledgement and engaging with Darren and letting him talk about and express his mom, uh, about his own feelings for his mom. The second time when he got really upset was when he was talking about um, uh, where he spoke to his mom on. Uh, Skype and his mum said to him look I think this thing is going to finish me and this kind of links in a little bit with what uh, Valerie has been saying um, you know about that bit of a people might know um, the person themselves might know more about their own condition than the family members and they may be more comfortable talking about it but you could see the impact that had on Dermot you know where he, like his mum was saying to him look this thing might might kill me this thing might take me and what he did he got quite upset we call that a grief burst where you get a burst of grief coming at you and similarly when he said earlier when he was talking and remembering his mom that was a grief burst and that may happen in your interactions with patients coming into your practice um, but again what really helps your suggestions are really good there around it, listening, allowing him to, uh, to talk about his mum, allowing him to express it. What will generally happen when we have a grief burst is what you saw there with Dermot. Get upset and, and take a moment and maybe kind of go into his own thoughts or his own emotions. And if we can just hold the space and support him around that, just in the ways that you're suggesting, what will tend to happen is that he will do what Dermot did. He self-regulated and he came back out of his grief burst. And you could see that by him saying, well, I'd look, I'd like to thank the nursing home staff. You know, they're amazing people. And that was like almost like Dermot had dipped into his grief and he'd done enough. He, he'd visited it for a bit and now he was coming back out again. A bit like we showed in that video earlier where you're moving between focusing on the loss spending a little bit of time there and then coming back out and focusing on the restoration and our role when we're engaging with people who are bereaved just as you're suggesting in your comments there is to facilitate to enable that natural grieving process and we do that by the kind of things you're suggesting there by not being afraid of the person's grief by not trying to fix it by not trying to uh, make it go away, but by just being with the person, allowing their grief and allowing the expression of their grief. Um, and th that really can make a difference to people. Thanks very much for your um, uh, comments there. Well, another one that has just come in there, and I would agree with this, acknowledge how awful the circumstances of the illness were. And do you know, you're so right about that. Um, Again, I was speaking with some people who had very difficult experiences with their loved ones during COVID and look, some less than ideal things. For example, one woman whose dad was dying was eventually after hassling to get to see him, did get to see him, but they brought her to the wrong man. So, you know, we, we've no idea what kind of stuff people uh, had to deal with in the height of the pandemic. And she said, like, it just you know, it was almost like he didn't matter. It was almost like I didn't matter. So I think your, your suggestion there about acknowledging how awful the circumstances of the person's illness are, I think as GP practice nurses, you're in a unique position maybe to be able to engage with people and people need to be able to express 
some of what they experienced in COVID. There's a danger that we may move too quickly. And look, it's great that we're out of COVID. It's great that it's not as big an issue for us, but people are carrying a legacy of experiences and it can really help to have those experiences validated, to have their grief validated, to say, look, this was unfair. It, it was not the way it should have been. It was unfair on loads of levels. Um, and, but sometimes getting that from a healthcare professional, like a GP practice nurse, makes a big difference to people because they respect you. They respect you as somebody who knows about these kind of things. Um, and is an important person in their life. So that validation that you can give is really, really important. Thank you very much for that. I'm just going to hop back here. So another area that I just want to mention um, that is relevant uh, in the work that you do is um, two different types of grief that we talk about, personal and professional grief. So what do we mean by that? Personal grief is essentially grief that goes on in our own personal lives, and that's going to affect you. It could be my mom dying or somebody in my family being impacted, and that's my personal grief. But there's also grief that happens because of the work that I do. And the work that you do as GP practice nurses is going to bring you in contact with patients and with patients who will have experienced bereavement themselves and with patients who have died. And I suppose the point about professional grief is it can impact on you as well. So let's just have a quick look at this. There's uh, quite a few people writing about this now, particularly as a result of COVID. Um, and one of those uh, who's writing is uh, Rabo uh, and Huang and et al. Um, and they talk about healthcare workers recognizing their responsibility to support the bereaved loved ones of our patients. But we must also attend to our own professional and personal grief in the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is kind of new in the sense that it's always kind of been there, but there's a realization because of the stress that healthcare workers have been under, and that includes you, that we need to be aware of the impact of grief on us as professionals. Our healthcare systems have a primary responsibility both to prepare healthcare workers and to support them in their anticipatory and realized grief. Special attention must be paid to our healthcare worker trainees who may have not yet developed personal or professional grief management strategies and are coming into healthcare practice during a time of great disruption to both teaching and clinical care. And again, just recognizing the importance of uh, that idea of personal and professional grief. And again, I'm just going to show a short video, and this will just look again at those two types of grief. The workplace and grief. Grief is often a taboo topic in the workplace and can be difficult to talk about. Whether you are the one who is bereaved or you are supporting a colleague who is grieving, it is useful for everyone to learn about grief recognize how it can impact on people and know how to respond. In all types of workplaces, support for staff who are grieving is a key element of staff well-being. There are two types of grief that are relevant in the workplace. There is the personal grief of an employee and or the professional grief that can arise as part of their work. For example, when a resident, patient or service user dies. Employees need to be supported by their organization around any grief particularly where the grief arises as part of their work. To boost commitment and morale and reduce unnecessary leave and turnover, it is important to create a supportive workplace around both personal and professional grief. So that idea of this supportive workplace, and again, it's just having an awareness that uh, I can be impacted by grief in my own personal life but also I can be impacted maybe by the death of patients or by the, impacted by the situations that patients may come to the GP practice with. 
So what can help? How do we talk to and support someone who is grieving? Um, some of the things that help, uh, and this is both for ourselves and also for patients who you might be interacting with. Firstly, allowing ourselves to grieve. And again, a bit like the suggestions you've made there in the chat function around listening to people, allowing people to express their grief, um, about being able to um, facilitate, if you like, that natural grieving process, not to be frightened by it, um, but to enable it uh, and to be present to people. Um, expressing grief in your own way is really important. We don't all express our grief the same way we feel it, but we might express it differently. Some people may like to talk about their grief, be open about their grief with others while other people might be more private and may look to process or express their grief through activity, both ways are appropriate. They're different and there isn't one way that is better than another. So again, being aware that there can be differences and sometimes that can be more obvious around gender. We might see that men might be more uh, comfortable maybe in, in um, activities or that, though there are some women who are also comfortable that way as well. The key point here is that there are differences and differences are okay. There isn't just one way to do it. Caring for yourself, again, whether it's personal or professional grief, really important. And being able to pass that advice on to your patients, to look after themselves, to be gentle with themselves, to take care of themselves if they're grieving. And again, you know, a couple of the examples have been where there's been maybe a death of a child and um, or a younger person and the ongoing loneliness. And sometimes we can't fix that. Sometimes uh, we, we can't make it better, but what we can do is be present as a human being to a human being um, and not to underestimate the value of that. And just simply having somebody acknowledge your grief, simply having somebody acknowledge, look, this is a difficult time for you, um, and acknowledge that there is loneliness and that that can be hard. Um, and for us to walk alongside somebody who is grieving for a short part of that journey can be really helpful. Um, thirdly, to seek support and avoid isolation. And this is where, again, your role is so key. Um, some people may struggle more than others, even with good support and even with, you know, uh, your own support that you provide and family and friends, they may be struggling with their grief. And that is where referring or pointing out resources can be really helpful. We have a three step approach uh, which can uh, be adopted in your practices. Um, and it's really a simple bereavement first aid, three steps um, developed out of psychological first aid, but really useful. Three steps, AVS, acknowledge. So acknowledging what has happened if somebody has died, if somebody has a diagnosis, if that's dementia, if it's cancer, if it's a life limiting illness, just acknowledging that that is a change in somebody's life, that that can be difficult. And to offer our sympathies, you know, if somebody gets a difficult diagnosis, you'd probably do this naturally yourselves. Look, I'm so sorry that the news is bad, but there's something really valuable about having someone else genuinely uh, acknowledge what has happened to us. V is for validate, and that's validating the feelings that the person may have. The example of somebody who is lonely, maybe after a partner has died. Um, and it's not that we can take that away, but we can acknowledge it. Um, and that is simply saying, you know, if somebody's saying, look, I'm lonely, I think that must be very difficult for you. Uh, and I can understand how you would feel lonely at the moment. We'd love to take it away. We'd love to change it. It's not always possible, but we can be there with somebody as a presence, as a helpful presence. Um, and that can make a difference. Um, you know, with grief, there isn't an easy answer. There isn't a quick way through it. Sometimes we just have to, uh, and I'm sure you know this with your patients, particularly where you work with them from cradle to grave. Sometimes we just have to uh, stick it out and be with them in difficult times, uh, but not to underestimate the value of that. Um, and support and signpost is the third step. Support colleagues, support patients, support family members. Um, and again, 
uh, if it's professional grief, keeping an eye out for colleagues and how they're doing. Um, I'm not sure how that works in your practices, but you, you'll know some of the different situations that people are dealing with. And that's maybe just uh, keeping our antenna up and just checking how people are, if they've had a difficult case or um, a difficult set of cases or a very busy day, just checking in, see how people are. Um, so support uh, is really important um, and signposting towards further help if that's needed. Um, this is from Selman, and uh, again, it arises out of COVID-19 and the uh, increased awareness of the value and role of healthcare workers. And this is particularly around the value and role of healthcare workers around bereavement. Healthcare workers have a role knowing about and referring to appropriate services. And again, that has come up in, in your introduction but also providing information about grief and helping to alleviate barriers to support. And this is a big one, changing social attitudes. Simply broaching the subject and acknowledging a patient's loss with simple words, I'm so sorry, go a long way and show that bringing grief into the consultation room is acceptable. Recording a bereavement in patient records asking how they are doing at their next appointment and following up when patients are distressed are good ways to show ongoing concern and to reassure patients that their grief matters. And those last five words are really important. Sorry, six words. Reassuring patients that their grief matters. They matters to your practice. They matters to your GP practice. It matters to you as the GP practice nurse. That makes a huge difference to people. Um, so in terms of getting support, uh, I did mention the bereavement support line, and uh, this is the support line number. It's 1-800-80-7077. Um, it's a free service. I would encourage you to uh, keep a note of that number. Um, it's really useful to have for you as uh, something in your back pocket if you're engaging with the family and if they're struggling and um, they're really good, experienced and human people on the end of the line. So this is useful for both uh, referring patients to, but it's also useful service for you as a GP practice nurse. There may be some situations where you're not sure what to do and you're thinking, gosh, should I say a bit more to this person or am I, should I be concerned? It's a really good place for you to use as a check and just ring somebody there. They're very experienced in bereavement. Say, look, here's the situation. What do you think? Um, so you can use it for both personal grief and you can use it for professional grief and you can use it for referring to or referring your patients to. Uh, we also have a free e-learning course, uh, which that first video on the grieving process is part of it. And that's the link for there. This will go out in your um, slides, which you'll get at the end. And that's free and available for your own use. And again, you can recommend that to uh, patients or their families. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little over time, but I'm going to finish with this. Uh, this is a quote from Paula Darcy. And Paula wrote a book called When People Grieve. Paula um, was involved in a car accident with her husband and child, and she was pregnant at the time. Um, unfortunately, her husband and her child were killed in the accident. She survived and the child she was carrying survived. It took her a long time to come to terms with her grief. But this is a quote from that book. Um, and I'm just going to read it to you. She says, grief is the heart's response to any deep loss. There are many deaths in life and we grieve all of them. We mourn the loss of employment, the death of our pets, infertility, divorce, and each death and disappointment experienced within our relationships. We mourn losses set in motion by natural disasters and acts of terror. Grief has been both my great teacher and the hardest work I have ever done. It cut me in two, excising my innocence and my illusions. I learned to be gentle with myself and I learned that there is no right way. I learned that my relationship with those who have died is not severed by death. I know them in spirit, within my heart, in a new way. And it all took time. So I'm going to finish there. I just thank you again for uh, 
being part of this webinar, I suppose to encourage you around the role that you have. You're in a unique position to be able to listen to, to be able to encourage, to be able to validate the grief of patients who come to your practice. Um, and I think that advice from Paula that uh, I learned to be gentle with myself is very good advice for anyone who's grieving. It's very good advice for you as well in the work that you do and to make sure that you look after yourselves. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop there and hand back to Mertz. Thanks, Bethany. That was great. Um, I could see even through the chat and um, the experience in the room, you know, with the nurses and their, their feedback. It was fantastic. And um, there was a lot of learning there. I love the three step approach and um, the first bereavement, first aid, acknowledge, validate and support. And I think everybody here in the chat really, you know, recognize the importance of listening, being present and giving time has been very key to this. Um, Self-care as well, really important for everybody who's listening today. So we all have to look after ourselves in this too when we're caring for other people. Um, the e-learning session, Brefney, that you, you mentioned there uh, is fantastic. So that's a, a great resource for everybody in the room. I just want to thank you both, or the three of you, should I say, Nicole, uh, Valerie and Brefney, in terms of your presentations today. And it was great because it was 